Good morning, Manitou. Glad that you were able to join us this morning on Sunday, June the 14th. Once again, we're continuing to do our worship service virtually for the safety of all of our congregation. This is no one's ideal. We all would like to be able to gather together, and at some point we hope to be able to do that. But for now, this is the way we're going to go. And so um, we have, uh, we've got this worship service, and we're glad that you have joined with us this morning. As we have uh, been beginning our worship service for the last couple of years, uh, I invite us once again to, uh, to begin our service by being reminded of who and whose we are. And so I invite you to look over to Trevor over here as he... As he pours the water into the baptismal font, I invite you to repeat after me. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Holy and beloved. Holy and beloved. Let these waters of baptism be a reminder that there is nothing that can take this identity away from you. This is poured over you almost as if it's like tattoos ink that will be permanent no matter what. So once again, join with me to all together say, I am a child of God. Holy and beloved. Join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise God, God in the sanctuary. Praise God under the open skies. Praise God's mighty deeds. Praise God surpassing greatness. Praise God with a blast on the trumpet. Praise God with strumming strings. Praise, Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with banjo and flute. Praise, Praise God with clanging cymbals. Praise God with loud bass drum. Praise, Praise God with fiddles and mandolins. Let everything that breathes, breathes. Praise the Lord. Let, Let everyone with breath praise the Lord. Let everyone with breath praise the Lord. Let everyone with breath praise. <laughs> Let everyone breathe. Hear us, Hear us the Lord. Lord.
right, we have a chance here for announcements. Anyone have any announcements? If you have an announcement and you're watching this now and you want to just send an email to me for an announcement, something, an opportunity, then uh, yeah, send that and we'll make sure to make sure that, that makes the either Sherry's uh, prayer list or the Manitou Weekly we send out. A um, couple announcements from me. Um, one is that um, we're going to have next week's worship service will be on Zoom and then we'll record it and it'll be on YouTube again. The Sunday after that, we're actually going to meet here at the church. We're going to meet outside and we're going to do a little worship service and then we're going to actually, our worship service is going to literally be service. We're going to get some bags and get some gloves. We're going to go out and pick up trash in the neighborhood uh, for that morning. So we'll get more details out to you in the emails, but uh, uh, just for now, you can go ahead and plan on June the 28th, meeting here at 10 o'clock that morning. Um, I think that is it for now for the announcements. Um, if you are not getting in either of the emails, please call the church, 253-472-1606, and let us know, so we'll make sure to get you on the emails. With that, now I want to see, are there any prayer requests? We have our little pocket audience here this morning. Are there any prayer requests from this small gathered group? While they're thinking, I'll offer a couple. Uh, I want to offer prayers for Carol Robertson as she moved from her facility to a different facility. Um, pray that that transition goes well. This is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Another prayer request. This is really a praise. Um, we've been we've been praying uh, for the Cheyenne House and how to work that out. And actually, uh, Cody and I got to meet with the. Um, the mother and the two boys who will be moving in there as soon as we're able to get the, uh, the house fixed up. Um, so that is a praise because I think it's, she just seems wonderful and the Tacoma Community House looks like a great help for us, uh, partner with us in this endeavor. So you will be getting an email <laughs> of ways you might be able to help out. In fact, that, that email went out this last week. And so if you want to help with fixing up the house and getting it ready, painting it, and please email Jeremy Doty with your name. And, uh, and uh, actually, Cody Doty. We'll make it Cody. And uh, we'll get one of them, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get that going on. So, a praise for um, uh, a new tenant moving into the Cheyenne house. This is our praise to the Lord. Lord, hear our praise. Benjamin. Jane. Praise that we're in phase two, and prayers that we are still being safe and um, going about trying to return to our daily lives cautiously so that we don't get another outbreak. All right, so praise for moving into phase two and prayers that there's not another outbreak. This is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. I want to uh, offer uh, praise on behalf of Sherry. Her grandson, Keone, has has gotten his port removed and he has been able to eat sushi. So, um, <laughs> so huge recovery from from the, the cancer he's been fighting. And uh, so, this is our praise to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our praise. There are other prayers and praises. Sherry sent those out in the email, so we'll uh, we'll gather those up as we gather all these prayers together. Karen, I have praise for equity out of the turmoil and for all of the things locally and nationally that are happening. Okay, so praise that prayers that equity comes out of the turmoil and, and uh, prayers for all that's happening nationally, uh, that it moves towards more justice um, for everyone in our country. This is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. All right, I invite us to gather these prayers and praises, and you, if you're watching at home, to, uh, to join with us in these prayers. I'll leave some space in the middle, and if you, you know, I invite you to, to pray where you are, and offer that prayer, and then we'll all pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would give us the faith to believe that you are here, that you're here with us, that you're also here wherever the congregation is spread out promise to go with us, and we pray that you would uh, help us um, to 
to believe that you hear uh, our prayers and our praises. Now we pray as you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, through Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Listen now for the word of the Lord. The harvest is great, the labor is few. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the good house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Children, go where I send thee. How shall I send thee? I'm going to send the one by one, one for the little bitty baby that was born, born, born. Y'all remember, remember singing that? Way back in December, before the turn of the decade, back before Corona simply meant a cheap beer, and before uh, we had economic unemployment levels that are at historic rates. Before the names George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and Emmanuel Ellis were known by almost everyone across the country, things are different now. Things are different. And God is still sending. How are you being sent? How are we being sent? Our passage this morning that Janie read begins not with a scent, but with a went. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching, proclaiming, and curing every disease and every sickness. Jesus went curing every disease and sickness? We could use some of that, Jesus. As of today, over 2 million Americans have been infected by the coronavirus. And of those two million, almost 113,000 have died. Put that in context. Since the Vietnam War, including the Vietnam War, and every war conflict since then, over 67,000 soldiers, American soldiers, have died. This is almost twice that. 
continue to put into context, the number of soldiers who died in the First World War was 116,000. We, unlike, unfortunately, will probably pass that number by the end of the week. It does seem like things are getting better for us. We've moved to phase two. Things have opened up. This is good. We're hopeful. But let's not make a mistake. The virus isn't gone. We don't have a vaccine. This isn't over. We're not done. So Jesus, if you want to walk through our towns and, and heal the sick and cure every disease, we would be happy to welcome you. Well, amidst the spread of this one disease, our country has been reminded of another disease. Unlike the coronavirus, this other disease is not novel, it's not new. It's been around for hundreds of years, shifting and adapting to avoid eradication. Our country has a long, sad history with this, this disease. The date of the arrival of racism in this land is disputable, based on how you define it. The simplest date is to start with 1619. That's the year a Dutch ship showed up off the coast of Virginia with a cargo full of 20 slaves who had been 20 um, Africans who had been stolen from their countries and were being sold into slavery in the colonies. First colonists arrived right around 1607, so it just took us 12 years to step into what has been called America's original sin. This disease set its hooks in our country and has been morphing and adapting ever since. The history that follows, it's, this is the part we don't really like to tell. We prefer to focus on Thanksgiving and Turkey and the positive aspects of that and George Washington and the cherry tree and apple pie on the 4th of July. And these are great things, of course. But there's another part of our story that we need to continue to be honest with. After those first slaves arrived over the next 260 years, over 500,000 men, women, and children were stolen and sold into slavery in the states. By 1864, million of our country's 31 million citizens were slaves. Slavery officially ended with the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1863, but it took the loss of over 600,000 lives in the Civil War to achieve this end. And that feels like it should have been enough. That, hey, all right, we've sacrificed enough for this. This is, it should be over, but it wasn't. What followed was, fall of the war was Reconstruction, Jim Crow South, segregation, redlining, mass incarceration, kept from voting, treated as second-class citizens, despite fighting in every war since, the, including the Civil War, and dying for the country. This was the thanks that our African-American brothers and sisters received. Now, this is not the place or the medium, nor am I the person to offer an exhaustive history of race in America. But at the same time, this is not the place, nor am I the person that can ignore our history of racism in America. I don't think Jesus will allow it. He's on a mission to cure diseases. And this is one of them. And we're being summoned to be a play a role in this. Are you willing to come along? I hope so. But, but Ken, you might say, what can we do? Racism has always been around and always will be. But Ken, you might say, I'm not a racist. But Ken, you might say, I'm against racism, but these protests, they're getting out of hand. I just can't support them. But Ken, I know, yeah, yeah. I, I want our people to be able to express their thoughts, no matter where you are on the spectrum. There's all manner of things you might say, but there, there's one verse. I, 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 this is the place I want to start. It's actually just a half a verse. Verse 36, we read this. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Do we have compassion on the crowds? When we see the crowds, when we see the crowds with protesters with signs that say Black Lives Matter, how do we feel? When we see the crowd being pushed back by the police and riot gear, how do we feel? Anger? Frustration?
frustration, irritation? Or like Jesus, do we feel compassion? It's common to think about compassion as sympathy or pity. If we can sometimes use it in the way that, um, to say, I feel sorry for you. This is, this is a little bit patronizing and demeaning, and that's not the definition of compassion. At least it's not the one I want to look for. You know, I love looking into the original language and the etymology of the word, and so this is no exception. This word compassion in the Greek is splodnizomai. Try to spell out. Try to say it three times. It literally means to be moved in your gut. Not, not that you are just moved by yourself. That would be, I'm a little sick. But this is that to have someone else's situation so affect you that it moves you in the bottom of your soul. That, that feeling when you know something's gone wrong and you just feel your heart drop to the bottom of your stomach. That's splodizomai. That is what Jesus was feeling when he looked out on the crowds. He felt the suffering, the disorientation, the struggle, the oppression that they were under, he felt it in himself. And then, this is why I think the translation is perfect. The word is compassion. This word compassion, it, it, it comes from the Latin, the C-O-M means with, and passion, which means suffering. From this you get the passion of Christ, the, the suffering of Christ. It's, it's interesting that this word at, at, at one point means suffering, and another, on the other hand, it means when you are on fire for something and you're excited about something. I think there's something in this. What, what's happening in this compassion is that it literally means that you suffer with, that you're suffering with someone else. Jesus, when he looked on the crowds, he, he was suffering with them. And you know this feeling. If you cried at Old Yellow when Travis had to shoot him, sorry if that's a spoiler for anybody, then you had compassion for him. If tears welled up in your eyes when you looked at JFK Jr. when he was like five years old and he reached up and grabbed his mother's hand when he was standing in front of his father's casket, that's, that's compassion. If he wept when he saw the survivors, uh, the families of those who were killed at 9-11, even though you didn't know any of them, that's compassion. When you feel the pain that someone else is feeling, that is compassion. To have compassion is to lose yourself for a moment and find yourself in the shoes of another person. It can be hard for us to lose ourselves. I know I, I try to hang on to myself as much as possible. It, I will admit, it's easier for me to have compassion to put myself in the shoes of someone else who has the same shoe type and size as me. It can get a little harder if those shoes don't look like my shoes, or they're not the size of my shoes, or they're in a different condition than my shoes. And yet, Jesus, as he looked out on this crowd, which was filled with people who had all different kinds of shoes, he felt compassion for them. He was able to walk in their shoes I think, um, I think that this marries up pretty well with what Jesus says about losing things. He says the one who loses their life will save it. I think this has something to do with compassion. That as we're able to lose ourselves in feeling what someone else feels, that there is salvation that can come from that. Compassion invites us to lose ourselves, our lives, even for a moment. I, and isn't this what Jesus, this is the, what he says when you love your neighbor as yourself? He invites us to put ourselves in the shoes of our neighbor and, and treat them as we would want to be treated. It's the essence of it. It's, it's, it's a form of compassion. If this were the case, if I, if I care for my neighbor as much as I care for myself, I, I dare say there would be few of any significant conflicts between neighbors, between cities, between states, between red and blue, between countries. Discussion? Yes. Debate? Yes. Disagreement? Yes. But fisticuffs? Dropping bombs? I don't think so. Because I wouldn't want to do that to myself. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. 
do we have compassion on the crowds? Can we have compassion on the crowds? And will we have compassion on the crowds? Jesus, it appears, sends the disciples to do just this. Now, some of you hear this invitation to feel compassion and feel it in your bones. You've been experiencing splodizomai for some time now. It's not a hard thing for you to do with um, to feel this. Others of us hear this invitation and think, yeah, I just don't feel it. I just don't feel moved. Well, honesty is the first step towards change. If this is you, know that not all is lost. Compassion is a feeling, but it's also a practice. Compassion as a practice is when we suffer with someone. This can mean we are with them when they are suffering. I venture to say that everyone who's listening here has done this. If you've gone to the funeral of someone else, perhaps someone you didn't know, you may not be grieving their loss, but you know the person who's grieving their loss. You may not shed a tear, but you are with them, and you're suffering with them. That's a kind of compassion. You're practicing compassion in that instance. These times are provided, the times we're in right now, providing opportunities to practice compassion with our African-American brothers and sisters. There have been vigils. There are marches. I'm going to start listing some of the march uh, opportunities to march, some of the gathering opportunities on the church website and in the email. Perhaps you're willing to join in the crowd. This is a way of stepping into compassion. Another way to practice compassion is to listen. They say that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. And so I came across this uh, to, to the thanks of Marlene sending me an email. Uh, on that email from Safe Streets, it had some different resources of ways to help us listen and become aware of what's going on. And one of the resources was put out by the Michigan League for Public Policy, and it's this cool little tool. It's a 21-day racial equity challenge. It is very simple. Each day, for 21 days, you listen to a little clip, you watch a clip, or you read a little section, and then you reflect on that in the little log book that's a, a, a log that she just provided. That's it. Over 21 days, you'll hear things that will enlighten you, you'll hear things that will probably tick you off, and hopefully we'll have a space to have that conversation and talk about that. It's not going to solve everything, but hey, it's a start. To feel someone else's pain, you have to be willing to stop and listen to what they're saying before you say, that's wrong, I don't agree. Listen is the first step. So this is my challenge to you is that, hey, let's, let's do this 21-day challenge together. The email you got this week had an invitation. If you send me your email back or you call, I'll send you the link. I want to know how many folks are participate so that we can uh, try to have some gathering. Please, let, why, what do you have to lose? What do you got to lose? Go ahead. Look, send me your, an email saying I'm in it, and I'll send you the link. So, children, go where I send thee. How shall I send thee? How is God sending thee? How is God sending me? How is God sending we with compassion? Not just with compassion, but also with us. God said, I'm looking for laborers. The fields are ripe for the harvest. There is healing out there. God says, I want you to be a part of this. As I mentioned way back in March, before Easter, that God is inviting us to be co-laborers in this. Collaborators. Collaborators in our own salvation as well as, a, as, as others. To be a part. To go with the Spirit. So, are we willing? Are we willing to be sent? Are we willing to go both compassionately and collaboratively, collaboratively. We, brothers and sisters, are in this together. May we awaken, even if it's slowly, to this kingdom of reality as we go. Let's pray. Lord, may you use um, some word or phrase in this passage in my very foul words. Um, I know it's hard to fully pay attention on all of this, but, but may some piece of it, Lord, be something that opens our eyes and opens our ears to you, to your spirit that's whispering, that's shouting, that's showing up in a way that we wouldn't have expected. 
calling us, Lord. Some of us are at places where like, I'm not changing my mind or anything on anything. And I just want to, I want to, um, I want to invite you into, um, into our spaces of, of hardened hearts to be willing to have them cracked open. Your disciples long ago were in those places as well, Lord. And your love opened up doors that seemed to be closed forever. So, Lord, we ask for this in your name. We thank you for being with us. We pray this in the name of the one who loves us beyond all reason. In your name we pray. Amen. Is there someone who has a prayer to accompany our offerings to God's presence? We'll just wait here. I'm just going to continue to wait until someone offers a prayer. Good. I, want, I didn't want you to miss that awkward silence that we often have in the worship service. I hope that makes you feel more like you're here to have that awkward silence. So here's my invitation, brothers and sisters. When Jesus sends the disciples out, he tells them not to go to the Samaritans or the Gentiles, but instead to the lost sheep of Israel. At first glance, Jesus appears to be missing a chance for the disciples to walk in the shoes of somebody else. On second glance, I can see what Jesus was up to. Jesus knows that the disciples still need converting themselves. After all, this is still the group who, after being turned away by a Samaritan village, says, Hey, Jesus, you want us to call down fire and destroy that village? They're in need of their own ongoing conversion. Before sending them out to the Samaritans' Gentiles, which he'll eventually do, he sends them to their own. He sends them to the people with whom they have a voice. And these times I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about, who are my own at this point? With whom do I have a voice? Guess who I came up with? You all, or as I say, y'all. 
I hope that's the case. I hope I have some measure of voice in this community because you have a voice with me. And so I want to keep calling out and calling us back to be able to pay attention to others, to be able to pay attention to God's presence in that. And it's going to make people feel uncomfortable and it's going to be challenging. I just hope you stick with it. I hope we can do this together because it's worth it. So, brothers and sisters, know that God's called you. God's sending you. God's going to go with you. And so, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may God be with you until we meet again. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.